So ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the next session, session five of this conference. Challenges and opportunities are indeed very familiar grounds uh, for the Hague conference. And uh, it's in a way what has gotten us actually here within the last 125 years and uh, will hopefully get us going for another 125 years too. Now, the fifth session is looking at these challenges and opportunities, and uh, our distinguished uh, experts will look at those, uh, adding to our discussion so far a further dimension, and that dimension is the actual birthday child. It is the organization itself, it's the Hague Conference. And um, it is very, very important that uh, we all pay attention to what is going to be said because this is also preparing for tomorrow's breakout sessions, which will be led by our three rapporteurs. Um, and we have Hans van Loon, who will be looking after the family law uh, session, Anselmo Reis, uh, who will be looking after civil procedure and international cooperation, and Niklaus Meyer, who will be looking at the commercial and financial area. And the sessions will take place, you may ask yourself, in the following rooms. And that is very important because we will not gather here in this room. You can come up to here, but we will not gather here in this room necessarily unless you are interested and registered for the family law area. The family law breakout session will be in this moot court. The commercial people will go to level nine of the university. There is a designated room for us. And those who are interested in civil procedure and legal cooperation will go to, ele to level 11. Now, this sounds all very cryptic, but as I said, come up to this venue here. There will be all the student helpers outside, and they will be point you in the right direction, and you will find it very easily. But we will not gather as a plenary in this venue tomorrow morning. Just keep in mind, Family law here, commercial, room nine, uh, in uh, level nine, and civil uh, procedure on level 11. Now, there has been a question about the uh, uh, transport back tonight from the pier, and uh, we will arrive back at the pier at 10 o'clock with a boat or just around uh, that time. And there will be a coach service leaving that pier back to the hotel, which you can catch. And uh, so it will be about 30 to 45 minutes. That depends a little bit on the traffic, I was told, even at 10 o'clock at night. Um, and uh, you will then be safely back um, where, um, at the Hotel Gen. Now, this session must wrap up at 5.30. There is no other way about that. Uh, we will then immediately leave this venue um, and guided by our uh, lovely student helpers, uh, we will go to the departure point and the coaches will depart at 5.45. As I said this morning, this is sharp and unless you want to join us swimming, you will have to be there or you miss out. Ladies and gentlemen, on that I don't know whether it's a happy note, but on that note, <laughs> well, I don't know, maybe we have passionate swimmers who love this kind of stuff. Anyway, on that note, I hand over to the Secretary General of the Hague Conference on Private International Law, Dr. Christoph Bernasconi, who will moderate the next session. Thank you very much.
Still doesn't work. Oh, there yeah, it does. Okay, wonderful. Thank you very much, Tom, and welcome everybody to this uh, session five. Time to time, I like to remember myself that I'm a happy man. And this is one of these occasions for various reasons, of course. First of all, it's a wonderful conference. Thank you very much indeed. I'm a happy man also because apparently I'm the first moderator not to be subject to the Davos rule. Um, <laughs> Being Swiss myself, it would have been very confusing for me to practice Davos against the backdrop of the very impressive Hong Kong skyline. But um, I, I have the suspicion that at the end of the day, we'll see that it doesn't actually make any difference <laughs> in the way we, we conduct the, uh, the, the panels. But most importantly, I'm a happy man because I'm in the presence of four I'm sure David will confirm one, two, three, four panelists. Thank you. <laughs> Um, excellent uh, panelists to start focusing the discussion on what all of this actually means for the Hague Conference as an organization. Um, my dear panelists do not need uh, any introduction. Professor Linda Silverman from New York University, Yuko Nishitani from Kyoto University, Richard Frimpong Opong from uh, the uh, Thomson Rivers University, BC, Canada, and last but certainly not least, uh, Fausto Bocar, Emeritus, Professor Emeritus uh, of International of the University of uh, Milan. And without further ado, uh, in particular because I don't have any uh, swimsuit with me, um, I would like to ask Richard, first of all, to share his thoughts with us. Thank you, Richard. Thank you very much. So in these remarks, I okay. so in these remarks, I intend to deal with um, basically three main issues. Um, I want to explore the relationship between the Hague Conference and Africa. Um, I will highlight some areas of positive achievements and also point out some of the emerging issues and areas that are in need of attention. I'll start by noting that in 2006, I published a paper in the Yearbook of Private International Law, um, which was entitled The Hague Conference and the Development of Private International Law in Africa, A Plea for Cooperation. In that paper, I explored how Africa's engagement with the Hague Conference can further develop the subject at both national and continental levels, and also help to resolve conflict of laws problems on the continent. At the time of writing that paper, Africa's engagement with the Hague Conference was modest at best. Only three African countries were members of the Hague Conference. Those were Egypt, Morocco, and South Africa, while 18 African countries were party to the conference's various conventions. African intellectual and academic investment in the work of the conference was also minimal, with very few academic papers addressing the conference's work from an African pe perspective. My paper advocated for increased cooperation between the conference and Africa and noted that the channels for cooperation are many and can be mutually beneficial. Cooperation between the Hague Conference and Africa has increased significantly since 2006. In fact, conclusions of the 2015, 2016, and 2017 meetings of the Council on General Affairs and Policy have noted the necessity of expanding the organization's work globally, including throughout Africa. Furthermore, in 2015, the Permanent Bureau developed an African strategy and had it approved, which it is currently implementing. Since 2006, Burkina Faso, uh, Mauritius, Tunisia, and Zambia have become members of the conference. A number of African countries that were previously not party to any Hague convention have also become party to at least one convention. And here I have in mind Gabon, Ghana, Kenya, and Rwanda. So far, the Inter-Country Adoption Convention and the International Child Adoption Convention have been popular with these new countries. In total, 
in addition to the seven African states that are members of the conference, we have 22 other African states that are party to one or more of the Hague Conventions. It's also noteworthy that a number of judicial and other conferences with a focus on Africa have been held by the conference or under the auspices of the conference. These include an international conference on cross-border cooperation in civil and commercial matters, uh, which was held in Morocco in 2014. And the 25th, in 2015, there was also a conference on commercial private international law in East and Southern Africa, which was held in Johannesburg, South Africa. More recently, in November 2017, the conference in collaboration with the African Foundation of International Law and the Hague Project hosted a group of African chief justices and other judges from um, Africa. This effort to integrate the work of African judges in the work of the conference is definitely positive. Indeed, there have been a number of instances in which African judges have made reference to Hague conventions in their judgment, even at times when their respective countries were not party to the relevant convention. Notwithstanding these positive developments, Africa is the continent least connected with the Hague Conference. And if you look at the color of the faces in this room, you will definitely see that this is true. Thus, for the Hague Conference to remain the preeminent organization that develops high quality solutions in the area of private international law, the conference's current level of engagement with Africa must be enhanced. The conference has the opportunity to address challenges in Africa's legal landscape, especially in the areas of commercial law and family-related um, conflict of laws issues. Moreover, the expansion of regional economic integration and increased foreign investment in Africa demand a rethink of some of the existing conflict of law rules. These developments provide the conference with opportunities to engage with legal issues of continental importance. Currently, the African Union has recognized eight regional economic integration organizations on the continent, the East African community being the most developed one, it being a common market. Throughout Africa, increased cross-border transactions resulting from economic integration and foreign investment raise important issues, such as the extent to which courts will uphold jurisdiction and choice of law agreements, as well as enforce foreign judgment. In this regard, it's noticeable that some African governments have enacted legislation that potentially will undermine the effectiveness of choice of forum and choice of law um, agreements. <clears throat> An interesting problem that has resulted from regional economic integration in Africa is the issue of enforcement of judgments of regional courts in national courts. Most of the African regional economic communities have courts of their own, which allow individuals to litigate before them. There is uncertainty as to how an individual who obtain a judgment from such regional courts can enforce it at the national level. For example, in one South African case, the South African court had to adapt the common law regime on enforcing foreign judgment in order to enable it enforce a judgment from the Southern African Development Community Tribunal, which is a regional court. The same judgment was denied enforcement in Zimbabwe because according to the Zimbabwean court, that judgment was contrary to public policy. More recently, the High Court of Ghana refused to enforce an $800,000 judgment obtained against the government of Ghana from the ECOWAS Court of Justice. I think instruments such as the Hague Choice of Court Convention and the recently adopted Hague Principles on Choice of Law in International Commercial Contracts could provide internationally accepted solutions to some of the emerging issues. In general, the Hague Conference Conventions can serve as models for the development of regional instruments as well as national laws. Effective first steps should definitely involve the conference's continuous promotional work with African government, judges, and policymakers. 
there is definitely the need for the conference to strengthen its relationship with the African Union and African regional economic communities. In the area of family law, international adoption and surrogacy are two important subjects. In June 2015, a special commission of the Hague Conference adopted a declaration on the need to develop a harmonized framework for the adoption of children from Africa. The recent decision by the Ethiopian government to ban foreign families from adopting Ethiopian children definitely cast a spotlight on the adequacy of the international legal infrastructure that facilitates the adoption of children and the extent to which that infrastructure serves to prevent abuse and neglect abroad. Like many African countries, Ethiopia is not a party to the Hague Adoption Convention. The international aspects of surrogacy is also generating some interesting cases in the absence of legislation on the issue. In a 2014 Kenyan case, the court describes surrogacy as, and I'm quoting, not a hypothetical issue anymore. In a more recent case, the court noted that there is no doubt that in Kenya we require a law to regulate surrogate agreement in order to protect all involved and the affected parties, including most importantly, the children. South Africa appears to be the only country that regulates surrogate agreements with legislation. However, the South African legislation does not deal with the international aspects of the subject. The conference's continuous work on private international law issues surrounding the status of children, including issues arising from international surrogacy agreement, is welcome. The conference would stand to benefit from seeking relevant input from African countries and experts as these works advance. As I noted in the 2006 paper, the absence of African participation in the negotiation process may lead to situations where the interests of Africa are not fully accounted for during the negotiation process. To this end, in developing conventions, it will be useful to extend consultation, including relevant questionnaires, to non-member states so that their perspectives can be brought to bear on the work of the uh, conference. As the former Secretary General of the conference, uh, Professor Hans Van Loon, noted in his recent Hague Academy inaugural lecture, and I'm quoting, he noted that negotiations must be more inclusive and responsive to the needs of a growing number of developing countries, unquote. Finally, an important missing link between the Hague Conference and Africa is the absence of a, a physical presence on the continent. Consistent with the organization's 2002 strategic plan, the conference should expedite the steps required to establish a physical or representative presence on the continent. The conference currently has regional offices in Argentina and Hong Kong, both of which have been lauded for advancing the work of the conference in their respective regions. While compared to other regions of the world, only 29 African countries are party to one or more of the Hague Conventions. This is not an insignificant number of states. The conference's increased engagement with Africa is critical to making it a truly universal organization. Thank you. Richard, thank you very much indeed for these very thoughtful comments, uh, which provide almost a, a list of bullet points to go through for or providing work for, for, for the next years uh, to come. Um, you know that Africa has been identified as a, as a priority. Uh, I would like to stress that I made it a point, an explicit point, that my first official mission would actually take me to Africa to underscore and underline the importance of uh, Africa as a, as a strategic uh, development. For the record, I have to uh, stress that the Africa strategy was formally not approved. 
what the council did do, however, is that it identified universality as a, a tenet for the uh, Hague Conference as a strategic direction, and developments in Africa were very much part of this uh, of this development, but uh, the strategy as such has uh, not been uh, approved. But that is not an obstacle uh, for us to uh, continue to develop uh, efforts, uh, try to increase uh, the visibility in Africa. Um, we do it through a cooperation with the East African Union, for example, for the Upper Sea Convention. We had a joint program with them. We have a cooperation agreement with OHADA now that we try to uh, develop. We're still trying to seek the proper channel to reach out to the African Union and, and see how best to work with them. And I would love to do this uh, with you and, and your colleagues and rely on, uh, on your advice, uh, Richard, because uh, your efforts in Africa to promote uh, the work of the Hague Conference are not just welcome, but, but really uh, very, uh, very important. Um, the regional office, um, now I really have to be careful because uh, this is a, a touchy uh, model. Um, you know that the members of the Hague Conference uh, have asked us to develop a framework for future regional officers and as I said in the opening remarks it's complicated uh, and uh, leave it at that but uh, talking in a personal capacity I can certainly uh, express my full agreement with you that the Hague Conference needs in my view actually at least one regional uh, presence in, in Africa but the continent is so huge and based and, and different uh, in, in many respects that uh, we probably need more than one uh, regional presence, but uh, close uh, parent because, again, I know how, how delicate the subject matter uh, is and I recognize that. With no uh, further ado, then I would like to go to uh, Yuko and invite Yuko to share her thoughts with us. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for this kind introduction, and I'd like to sincerely thank the organizers uh, for this uh, warm invitation. It's a great honor and pleasure for me to be able to uh, give a speech in front of this uh, distinguished audience. Thank you. Um. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Okay. So, um, First of all, uh, we heard yesterday already from Professor Basedo about the history of the Hague Conference, and it started as an um, organization or uh, meetings and to unify private international rules within Europe, and then that has been uh, gradually extended to uh, other regions. Today, we are in the era of globalization, and at the same time, it's a time of regionalization. So we see... Uh, uh, regional economic integration, um, particularly in Europe um, and uh, uh, North and South uh, America, Africa, and also in Asia, we are gradually uh, coming together. Um, and that um, poses, uh, in some respect, challenges for adapting or joining Hague Conventions, in my eyes. So um, uh, I'd like to uh, analyze, first of all, from the perspective of Asian jurisdictions, um, how far uh, we have joined the Hague Conventions. And uh, uh, secondly, I'd like to focus uh, on the point how um, possible uh, future paths can be sought at the Hague Conference. So first of all, um, the Hague Conference um, has been successful, of course, in family matters uh, with administrative corporations. Uh, if we look at uh, the Asian jurisdictions, uh, we have um, quite a number of uh, member states for the 1980 Child Abduction Convention and also 1993 Inter-Country Adoption Convention. However, if we look at uh, further um, the member states of the 1996 Child Protection Convention, there are uh, all over the world uh, 47 states, but um, no country uh, from Asia so far. And also for the 2007 Child Support Convention and Protocol, there are uh, 39 or 30 states uh, in the world that are member states, but uh, uh, not yet from Asia. So I have to here uh, say that um, I define Asia um, as a region uh, that stretches um, from the east, from Japan, till uh, 
Pakistan. Uh, that's the definition given by the J uh, Japanese Minister of Foreign Affairs. So please allow me to use uh, this definition of Asia. In any case, um, although uh, there have been um, quite a number of states that have joined 1980 and 1993 conventions, um, 1996 and 2000 um, have not uh, gained um, yet any countries from this region. As a background, um, I'd like to point out that um, Asian jurisdictions are quite diverse. So if we think about uh, divorce and as a uh, basic uh, family law institutions, uh, there are um, quite a number of countries that uh, accept consensual divorce, namely South Korea, Japan, mainland China, Taiwan, and Thailand, whereas uh, in the Philippines, there is not yet divorce as a legal institution. There are also jurisdictions that are based on religious or customary personal laws so that uh, family law institutions are split among persons that uh, are uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, India, and Pakistan. And there are um, two common law jurisdictions, namely Hong Kong and Singapore, whereas uh, the other uh, jurisdictions are based on civil law. So this um, diversity uh, poses a certain challenge uh, if we think about um, how to promote the Hague Conventions in this region. At the same time, um, what is remarkable in this uh, region is that uh, family law institutions are largely based on traditional notion of families. That means that uh, family law institutions are largely bound to heterosexual marriage, so that uh, no legal protection has so far been provided for same-sex couples, unlike in the Western countries. Uh, the only exception is Taiwan, where the Constitutional Court decided uh, last year that um, because of the uh, equality of the protection of couples, um, it is uh, supposed to uh, introduce same-sex marriage or same-sex protections um, in the future, but still the legislature uh, needs to take an action uh, to introduce this um, uh, institution so that uh, we still have to wait um, Taiwan to introduce certain legal protection for same-sex couples. We still have um, in most jurisdictions such as differences between legitimate and illegitimate children. It's almost, uh, in my eyes, um, against uh, the um, UN Convention on the uh, Children's Rights to say legitimate or illegitimate children. But still, uh, we do have these provisions in our statutes, and that's uh, the state uh, of affairs in Asian jurisdictions. And parental responsibilities are only shared so far as the parents are married. So for uh, unmarried couples, uh, there are no shared parental responsibilities, and after divorce, um, only one parent becomes uh, the sole custodian. And uh, also because of these uh, rather traditional and conventional family law institutions, rights and obligations are not, um, so to say, clearly stipulated in our statutes, and that um, causes uh, difficulties in enforcement. So because uh, rights and obligations are not explicitly defined in our statutes, um, providing uh, certain rights or obligations uh, in court decisions uh, is already um, uh, causes some difficulties and enforcement uh, also becomes some difficulties. So this um, uh, the picture um, of the Asian jurisdictions um, poses uh, certain challenges for the Hague Conventions in family matters. But uh, in my eyes, um, the Hague Conventions, particularly 1996 and 2007 conventions, uh, that have not yet gained um, Asian jurisdiction so far, are useful uh, mechanisms. And uh, they are also uh, very practical um, in terms of uh, providing practical solutions um, in uh, dealing with cross-border family uh, relationships. So um, by pointing out the usefulness, um, I think um, it is possible to encourage Asian countries to join more uh, the Hague Conventions. So um, if you think about uh, the 1996 Child Protection Convention, uh, this uh, works quite well to support and uh, complement the 1980 Child Abduction Convention. 
So once a child is abducted uh, from state A to state B, then under the 1980 Child Abduction Convention, the child is supposed to um, be returned to state A immediately. And in order to guarantee the safe return of the child, the 1996 convention serves, first of all, that uh, custody order um, to be rendered by state A, where the child uh, is, uh, is habitual resident, is to be recognized among member states of the 1996 convention. And when uh, in state B, where a child is uh, temporarily staying, uh, some urgent protective orders become necessary, then again, 1996 convention provides these uh, possibilities, and th that kind of orders can be uh, recognized and enforced in other states. And that um, provides an, um, supportive measures uh, to guarantee the safe return of the child to state A, and uh, um, in that case, uh, we do not need to use mirror orders or safe harbor orders to uh, guarantee the safe return of the child. So that's a very useful mechanism, and also in order to guarantee access of the child in state B. And uh, this morning we already heard about uh, the uh, future possible project um, of mediation. So if uh, parents reach an agreement in state B, that uh, after the return of the child to state A, the father shall pay the maintenance or um, provides and housing for the uh, uh, mother and the child and so on. This kind of agreement, uh, once uh, it can be made as a binding uh, order, then uh, that can be enforced also in state A. And that uh, is also a useful mechanism. It can be used um, also for uh, in Asian countries, in my eyes. If we come to um, judicial assistance, um, service evidence and apostille conventions have been quite successful in Asia as well. If it comes to cross-border business transactions, then um, nowadays we should think about um, how to um, guarantee um, an effective mechanism of dispute resolution. In that respect, um, although uh, arbitration um, has been an effective me mechanism thanks to the 1958 New York Convention, um, litigation has not been so uh, effective because um, the um, recognition and enforcement of foreign judgments have not been guaranteed uh, in uh, many uh, countries in Asia. So particularly, mainland China um, has uh, 33 bilateral treaties for uh, recognition and enforcement of judgments, so that uh, with these countries, um, they have an uh, effective mechanism of the um, enforcement of foreign judgments. However, because mainland China and South Korea and Japan respectively require reciprocity, for the enforcement of foreign judgments. So far, between mainland China and South Korea, or mainland China and Japan, there are no possibility of recognizing or enforcing judgments. And that hampers um, the uh, free circulation of judgments in the region. Mainland China has become um, generous in accepting um, reciprocity uh, in the recent court decisions, so that reciprocity has been uh, acknowledged in relation to Germany, Singapore, and the US, so that we hope that uh, things develop uh, in the future. But uh, still, in order to guarantee effective mechanism of recognition and enforcement of foreign judgments, I think uh, the 2005 Hague Choice of Court Convention uh, provides a useful mechanism. And um, uh, so far, uh, from Asia, Singapore uh, is the only country that has become the member state. And mainland, uh, uh, excuse me, China has signed um, already, and uh, uh, the ratification is uh, uh, awaited. And it would be uh, helpful to have this mechanism. And uh, I do hope that more uh, countries from Asia join the 2005 Choice of Court Convention, so that uh, circulation of judgments can be guaranteed. And um, in addition to that, the ongoing judgments project will uh, certainly be helpful to establish legal settings for an effective mechanism of uh, the enforcement of foreign judgments. Um, if we think about uh, what kind of uh, possible path that can be sought by the Hague Conference. Um, a lot of issues have already been addressed, so I do not want to repeat all the points uh, that have been addressed already. Um, in my eyes, first of all, um, 
it would be helpful to have a um, bottom-up approach so that uh, we try to find practical needs from local representatives or stakeholders sometimes so that uh, we can address uh, with uh, instruments the practical needs uh, in the future. And uh, also, um, because um, particularly Asia has certain particularities in family law institutions and particular needs in my eyes, um, perhaps we could also think about um, adapting an instrument in the future that uh, address particular needs of the certain region that uh, may be different from other regions, but still that can be a useful mechanism. And particularly in Asia, there is no supranational body to adapt um, private international instruments uh, like EU or OAS. In that respect, uh, the Hague Conference um, plays an important role in my eyes. As far as the legislative work is concerned, we can probably think about the utility of non-binding instruments and the di distinguish in what kind of matters we do need binding instruments as conventions and in other matters where model law principles or legislative guides uh, can be useful to have an a soft instrument that um, um, give guidelines um, for states um, that helps um, implementing these rules as a national legislation or help interpreting existing national statute in applying them uh, in certain cases. Um, as far as instruments um, concerned, um, we probably do not have to limit ourselves to a traditional sense of conflict rules or jurisdiction rules in the future, but in certain areas, there may be uh, useful to have substantive rules or also seek um, achieving regulatory functions uh, in that respect. So um, uh, in our parentage and surrogacy project, we are uh, so, uh, seeking um, uh, package instruments, uh, as Professor Ambassador mentioned yesterday, and. Uh, if possible, uh, we are also uh, thinking about uh, having some uh, substantive rules to give a uh, regulatory function for the instruments. And that can be uh, also sought as a future method in other areas in my eyes. As far as possible uh, developments uh, are concerned, we can think about secure transactions as a matter um, for the future projects, as uh, Professor Basel mentioned yesterday, intellectual property uh, may be also interesting if we uh, can uh, agree with um, adapting model law or principles in a, a soft mechanism, then uh, intellectual property, which is um, a delicate issue in some respect, but um, can be also a, a useful project um, of the Hague Conference. And maritime law, we have certain cases in Japan where uh, conflict rules are not yet clear and we have practical need to have um, concrete uh, rules for um, determining the applicable law, particularly um, for uh, public sales. Um, and that can be also a matter uh, that can be sought in the future. And also data protection, which is becoming a worldwide problem nowadays. And uh, I think uh, there are plenty of areas where at the Hague Conference uh, can provide a useful work. And uh, we do hope that uh, we can uh, continue contributing to the uh, further development of the Hague Conference. So thank you very much. That's the end of my talk. And thank you. Yuko, thank you very much indeed. Also here, lots of uh, food for thoughts and ideas for, for the future, bottom-up approach, practical relevance of the work. I think that's certainly uh, very much uh, on our minds as well. Certain regions, or s sometimes it's difficult to identify specific regions, or so it's just a, a groupment of states that have particular interests that they would like to, uh, to push forward. We see this currently with uh, the tourism project, for example. Um, interesting proposals, I think at the end of the day, it, it comes down to two things. Uh, first, a discussion, a proper discussion, what consensus means at the organization. I think that is the very fundamental bottom line of all of that. And uh, I hope we, we, we can have, either here or in another forum, a discussion on this, what I call the asymmetric consensus that would allow for some flexibility and states to, to move ahead, supported by the 
overall agreement of the organization as such that resources are being allocated to specific projects that may not necessarily immediately serve the interests of the entire membership. But again, that's a very delicate discussion uh, to have and it's for the members, of course, to have this uh, discussion and uh, not for, for, for us or we can, we can feed that discussion, but it's for the members, of course, to, uh, to decide. Substantive rules, regulatory um, uh, frameworks, yes. Um, um, there is, of course, the statute um, that certain uh, few people might see as an obstacle to these uh, developments. But uh, again, we're here to rock the boat. Thank you very much indeed to uh, participating in, in these efforts and for providing us with all these um, ideas, Yuko. Then, uh, Fausto, if I may ask you to go next and share your thoughts with us, please. Thank you. I'll try to keep it close to the, to the mouth. Is that uh, sufficient for hearing me? Well, um, uh, first I would like to, to thank you, Christophe, uh, for inviting me to this uh, interesting uh, and uh, important uh, meeting here in Hong Kong um, as a brainstorming place to uh, discuss our issues. Um, it's very, very uh, interested in that, uh, as you may imagine, as uh, I'm following the Hague Conference as almost uh, 50 years now. So that's uh, uh, clear. I saw developments, I saw, I can, but it's more difficult to imagine. The new developments in my position. So when uh, let me start with a with a small uh, prologue. That's the following. Uh, five years ago, the conference uh, decided to celebrate uh, 120 years. I didn't make the calculation of the weeks. Um, it's not very very uh, very important that, but uh, it's slightly less than what you mentioned, Christophe, yesterday. Um, and uh, the, the, at the conclusion of that colloquium at the Peace Palace, you, with your colleagues of the uh, Permanent Bureau, invited me to uh, interview the then Secretary General of the conference. And it was not an easy, an easy job, not uh, uh, used to interview people at the television or so, but I, I did my best and posed uh, Hans uh, a, a number of problems. I will not uh, go back to, to all of them. Of course, they are also published. It's easy to, uh, to access to them. But uh, uh, one of the main issues we discussed was uh, the transformation of the organization into a globe. Uh, that was obvious, the obvious question to be uh, discussed. One of the issues Hans uh, pointed to was uh, that the transformation was uh, uh, possible in a way also because of a sort of change of approach in the organization, in the legislation, in the legislative approach. That is, uh, instead of remaining as in the past on uh, 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 formulating abstract private international rules, which might not have been attractive, but for a limited number of states, uh, to move towards procedures and institutional machinery directly at the service of citizens. So to uh, put at the second uh, place the interest of states as much as possible and go to the interest of the individual. Um, and uh, uh, we know that uh, that change that occurred in that year um, thanks to, uh, to Hans and to his colleague William Duncan, uh, helped, was instrumental to uh, achieve uh, uh, results and success of several conventions concerning protection of children, for instance, uh, from the Adoption Convention to the Convention on Child, uh, on child Support. I will not uh, dwell on that because everybody knows uh, uh, this, uh, this point. Now, years later, uh, are the challenges years based on when, not the five years, but when the, uh, the, this occurred, are the challenges that the conference is facing today of the same kind? Do they require a shift, another shift of approach to something 
uh, to something else, uh, to new avenues, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's uh, still uh, to be kept uh, the idea that the conventions should, as much as possible, stay uh, away from the interest, uh, sovereign interest of states, and uh, uh, serve directly uh, citizens, as was indicated on that occasion. I um, uh, think uh, uh, that change that occurred does not require another change, another change in, in different direction. We should uh, uh, remain faithful to that, to that uh, change. But it, of course, affects our works and uh, uh, makes it uh, uh, necessary to think of subjects to be considered that may be dealt with, with that approach. And uh, when thinking of that, uh, as this panel is the first of the panels on uh, uh, challenges and opportunities, although we spoke of challenges and opportunities as of yesterday, uh, yesterday morning, starting with, uh, with uh, um, Jürgen uh, presentation, um, I tried to look at the issue of challenges from the material point of view of the subjects to be taken up uh, in, the, in a way that is maybe the most uh, difficult ones. When you analyze the two words, challenges and opportunities, uh, what is the link between the two? Are they two separate issues? On one side you have challenges, on the other you have opportunities, or you put them together? I tried to put them together. And my um, conclusion is that uh, the more a situation is challenging, the more it offers opportunity. And so in looking for what we should deal with, we should look at difficult subjects, not at easy ones. Uh, because the ones may, the small and easy ones may resolve some problems, but uh, if they are not uh, in the, put in a, in a context, in a more, uh, a more important, significant context, they don't reach any real result, uh, useful uh, result. Um, so I don't put this uh, to the point uh, that I will uh, talk for hours now and I will transform the challenge of reaching the boat on time into the opportunity to swim, to follow, to follow the boat. Uh, that would be too much, probably. But uh, um, looking at the situation now, I don't want even to list all the subjects that have been taken up uh, in the, com in the Commission on General Affairs, through the Times at the conference, to discuss uh, new topics. But uh, I think there is one phenomenon in the world that is really connected with uh, uh, private international law, or has interplay with private international law, which is uh, also reflected by the title of this conference, that speaks of increased interconnection. One of the issues that bring to interconnection is the mobility. But uh, there are various types of mobility. Uh, we tend to ignore, or up to now, the international community tends to ignore the mobility represented by mass migrations. And uh, this is a phenomenon that started not uh, quietly, maybe, is becoming very important. It's uh, not just a private international law problem, of course, it's a public international law problem. And the Institut de Droit International has uh, dedicated recently a resolution from the public international law uh, point of view. It's a problem of human rights. It's a complicated problem. But uh, we should perhaps uh, deal with that. I know the conference has already at a certain moment discussed something on this, but there was no follow-up at the end. Uh, I think that the fact that the phenomenon is increasing uh, should bring the conference to deal at least with some of the issues raised by the phenomenon. Those can be dealt with within the conference. Under the cooperation approach, essentially, I don't think we can resolve all the problems that may Arise, but we can give a contribution to uh, resolve some of the problems of uh, 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 
leaving other problems to other institutions. I mean, they started from the United Nations, the International Organization for Migration. There are a lot of instances that deal with this matter, the uh, Commissioner for Refugees and so on. But we should uh, uh, probably imagine, I don't have a full program now, the, uh, uh, the rules of cooperation rather than traditional conflict rules that could be uh, at the service of uh, individuals, that's migrants in the, in, the, in the current situation, but not necessarily only the migrant, because the resolving problem of migrants means having communities, state communities, that work better. It's, it's a problem of uh, contact of people, and uh, if that is regulated in some way, we may have uh, better societies, also uh, less conflictual society. And uh, uh, starting with problems like, uh, uh, that are not uh, as traditional problems for the judiciary, are essentially problems for administrative authorities. Uh, starting from uh, police authorities, even at the beginning on the border police authorities. Uh, the first problem is the identification of the personal status of the people. In a situation that frequently you cannot have documents, documents are not available, the countries from which the migrants come do not have a proper structure or are, are unreachable to have the documents. You don't have an affidavit with an apostille which rely to, to establish uh, the status of the, of the person. But you need uh, that status because uh, that's to ass assess the status because without that you can't apply migration law, for instance. Uh, migration laws are different in many states, but ma many states have migration law. And uh, it's not just a question for individual states to resolve because migrants move from one state to another. They go into a state, they have to admit that it's migrants, but then they move to another state where there are family members and you have to assess the family status in order to allow that according to migration law, uh, without touching the migration law of the states for the time being, but giving that cooperation that uh, allows for, uh, uh, for resolving problems. How to proceed in case of absence of documents? Do we leave to each state in situations that have more contact with more states? might be uh, something in which uh, a, 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 um, a, an agreement could be made by, uh, by state. This is linked uh, to uh, the problem that was a problem before the conference, and the conference decided not to do anything on that, or at least to set it aside, which is the assessment of foreign law. We discussed at the conference whether to have a convention on the assessment for the law. My recollection, it did not succeed because uh, if you put the problem before judicial authorities, you have the old dispute. Is the judge uh, obliged to apply ex officio the law or you have a proof of foreign law, depending on different systems. I think we should not deal with that problem, actually. The problem is that you have an authority, they have to decide on the status, and have to make application according to the law applicable. They find a solution for that case, might be a temporary solution, might be a solution that may require a further assessment, but uh, it could be revisited uh, later, but uh, uh, we should find a way, I think, the conference of dealing with the problem of foreign law. Because, uh, after all, even traditionally, the conflict of raw rules require the application of foreign law. And uh, the uh, possibility of accessing uh, in, a, in a, an efficient way to foreign law is really a problem, independent, irrespective of whether it is the, a judicial authority or another authority. And now, uh, should we have cooperation agreements? Yes, if possible. If uh, agreements with uh, a general agreement on this issue with uh, both states of origin 
a state of destination of migrants it can be made. This is certainly uh, useful. But if you notice, even the 96 Convention, how many countries from where mass migration occur are parties to that convention? Two or three. So in reality, in reality, the Convention on Protection of Children remains a convention uh, limited to a part of the world and does not touch upon other parts of the, of the world. Uh, one issue on which I wanted to, because as a general impact, I wanted to add, should we go only with cooperation agreements in order to get the uh, documents, to get the law and so on, or should we uh, elaborate a set of principles on this matter? I think we, the, we, the conference could bow both ways. On certain issues, you may need a cooperation agreement. On other issues, you have to decide without a cooperation agreement, it works. What if you cannot assess the status of the migrant? You put him on a plane and send him back? Or you deal with the question? What you do if you don't have the documents? How do you assess the status? What you do temporarily? This is something that perhaps could be uh, considered leaving a certain uh, uh, open position to states, give guidelines, and uh, hope that in the future, by applying these guidelines, you could reach a better harmonization of the, uh, of the matter. But I don't want to go uh, in detail on this. Uh, it's simply to say that uh, perhaps uh, uh, accompanying on some issues, principles, uh, and on other rules of cooperation, we might achieve a better, uh, a better result. I limited my intervention, limited to this, to, to this issue, uh, just to raise this point, uh, which is a global point, uh, is a regional point at the same time, uh, you spoke of regionalization and globalization. This is both. It touched upon the two, uh, the two uh, aspects of, uh, uh, of dimension, of cooperation. And uh, I believe uh, we should uh, dedicate uh, some uh, attention to it, uh, not necessarily to take all the issues, but to take some of them with a view to contributing to improve a situation where it becomes uh, hot in many, in many countries. Thank you, Fausto. Wow, yes, thought-provoking indeed. Um, what I keep is challenges mean opportunities. I certainly, certainly wholeheartedly agree. Uh, and bringing back discussions to, say, the Council on Migration and Foreign Law certainly would be uh, a challenge, but uh, an interesting one. Um, yeah, there's a lot of things to be said about it. also the use of soft law principles, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure this will uh, come up also uh, tomorrow in the course of, uh, of our discussion uh, again. But thank you, Fausto, again. And in the interest of time, I think I'll uh, just give the floor to uh, Linda uh, so that we have enough time also to hear to her contribution. Yes, well, first, um, let me again add my thanks uh, to the Hague Conference, to uh, Christophe Brusconi, and to the Department of Justice of uh, Hong Kong SAR. Um, I am really um, delighted uh, to be here. It's a real honor and a pleasure. Um, it was a long trip, um, but it was uh, well worth it, and uh, I hope um, I uh, will return uh, again. Um, it's very difficult um, to be the last speaker uh, right before the sort of end of a long day and uh, this wonderful uh, harbor trip. Um, it's also difficult because there have been so many uh, important things said from the start of Professor Bazado's uh, comments all through uh, the day, and I worry uh, a bit that some of this might be 
uh, repetitious. Uh, on the other hand, if I have things to say that uh, other brilliant presenters have said, uh, perhaps uh, it makes me feel good. So um, let me start. The, the focus uh, of the Hague Conference uh, has been on private international law, which um, as we have seen and as I think about it, uh, is about rules on choice of law, international jurisdiction, recognition and enforcement of judgments, and uh, related aspects of legal cooperation, which I think is part of private international law. But it's distinct from goals of unification or harmonization, which, uh, at least to me, are have been in the province of other international organizations, such as uh, UNCTRAL and UNIDROF. I'm not going to say anything about the role of the United States uh, specifically, except since I think I'm the uh, only sort of formal US speaker, uh, we had a US moderator. Um, I think it's worth noting a few things that explain certain challenges for the United States as a participant in the Hague Conference. I realize this is not about uh, the challenges to the United States. I will return to the challenges to the Hague Conference. But I think it's just worth noting this, because I think it um, is reflective of a larger problem for The Hague. The US is a federal system, and choice of law has been a matter for states in the United States. <clears throat> the American Law Institute, which has been referred to, uh, has taken a substantial role in developing restatements on choice of law to try to bring some coherence to this generally incoherent system, in my view, uh, in the United States. And some of you may know that um, there is work on a third restatement of choice of law. Um, and so even within the United States, there's difficulty in arriving at consensus. And at the international level at The Hague, there is often resistance uh, by just within the United States, uh, states in areas uh, where they believe um, that they should have competence. So it's a very complicated story for us. On questions of judicial jurisdiction, and I say that uh, to David uh, sitting there with the potential uh, experts group on jurisdiction, the options available to the US are often limited by constitutional restrictions as to what it can agree um, to do. And finally, some of you know, there have been some difficulties with implementations of treaties that the United States has no difficulty with, but implementation of private law treaties in the United States uh, presents its own federalism issues. And so I thought it was just worth uh, a note about that. Um, of course, what we are talking about are um, the challenges to the Hague Conference. And I think um, the breadth of the Hague Conference provides um, one of its sort of immense opportunities, as we've heard, particularly with respect to different regions, um, at the same time, one of its biggest challenges. Um, differences in legal systems along with cultural diversity among all these countries makes consensus about even private international uh, law norms uh, difficult to reach. And we've had developed regimes, uh, like in uh, the EU, which have um, already uh, taken stances, and even in the United States, um, they have taken views about private international law that would be hard to displace with a worldwide instrument. Then there are projects emanating from other international organizations with an interest in cross-border issues that cover really related space, and they present potential problems of conflict and overlap. But I think the history of the Hague Conference that we've seen and has been discussed uh, today and its flexibility in the past, including its cooperation with other institutions, offer optimism for the future, um, although the specific paths that it's taken do not necessarily predict the approaches it might take uh, in the future. So I want to take, again, a brief look backward. Maybe this is a bit of a summary in order to try to think about what guidance might be provided uh, in the future. So the various Hague Conference projects in the early years, as we discussed, were conventions directed to the choice of applicable law. I'm not going to name them. Uh, uh, Professor Bazzaro did that. Um, but not all of these conventions have had 
uh, significant adoptions. But I do note, and again, this was mentioned, um, the conference has identified discrete areas where the need for predictability with respect to applicable law may be at its height. So um, the example that I would think of is the recent Hague Securities Convention, a, a, a small area but a place where need was identified. And then there are other areas where the Hague Conference has directed its efforts away from formal choice of law rules, and we've again talked about this, to methods of cooperation in both procedural as well as substantive areas. And so, again, this afternoon we talked about the success of the Hague Evidence and Service Conventions, which have achieved cooperation in these areas of procedure, and I emphasize what um, Dr. Berlusconi said about facilitating mechanisms for service of process and uh, for obtaining evidence. That is the introduction of a central authority in the foreign state to effectuate service under its own rules or to receive letters of request to aid in obtaining information for use in uh, foreign proceedings under the evidence convention. And so um, that facilitation has been achieved. And then an even more activist variation of cooperation um, is found in the 1980 Hague Convention uh, on the Civil Aspects of International Child Abduction. Um, because in, a, in addition to creating a judicial remedy to achieve the return of the child, the abduction convention has a structure of formal cooperation, which again includes a central authority to assist foreign applicants in locating children who were wrongfully removed or retained, to provide assistance to achieve return of the child through formal or informal means, and to provide information to achieve uh, that result. And the 1993 Adoption Convention, again, established channels of communication between the sending and receiving countries to achieve cooperation between these countries and to assure a, a substance of safeguards in inter-country adoption. And the 1996 Protection of Children Convention, uh, which uses the framework of the harmonization of jurisdictional standards for child protection manners and then recognition of the ensuing judgments, I mean, the formal jurisdiction and judgments model, also has important provisions on uh, cooperation and communication. So again, there's a um, designation of a central authority its obligations are quite general, and it's designed to permit uh, delegation of responsibility to a variety of different local authorities upon whom the responsibilities under the convention are likely uh, to fall. So there are um, the, the special provisions, I think they've been alluded to, on access rights uh, and uh, the ability by a request uh, by a state uh, to uh, obtain information or consider measures are, again, other um, methods of cooperation among contracting states that I think have been successful. And one can point to the 2007 Child Support uh, Convention, again, where you have cross-border cooperation with respect to assistance in obtaining and enforcing uh, uh, child support orders. More traditional aspects, uh, I guess, are represented by the ongoing uh, Hague Judgments Project and the uh, earlier 2005 uh, Choice of Court Convention. On the other hand, the 2015 uh, Choice of Law Principles used the model of soft law to endorse uh, party autonomy in respect of applicable law. And it offered really a menu of a variety of options for countries to incorporate in their choice of law regimes for addressing party autonomy and commercial uh, transactions. And the notion, and we've heard this today, that maybe one size doesn't fit all, and the Hague can be very helpful in thinking about the variety of options that might work in different countries or in different regions. The principles also indicated that they could have relevance in the context of arbitration, a topic to which I'll return um, in a minute. Um, other uh, aspects of soft law have been uh, embraced by the, the Hague Conference. Um, the various guides to good practice, um, the uh, 1980 and 1996 protection conventions, have been influential uh, in the operation of the convention. And they have been referenced in court decisions interpreting those conventions. So they have been really very, very important tools um, in the interpretation of those conventions. Um, 
uh, and on the technical side, we should not overlook um, the maintenance of the uh, INCADAT uh, case law uh, uh, database um, that is now available, I think, in English, French, and uh, Spanish, and um, the development of the I support uh, system for um, the cross-border recovery of uh, support under, uh, uh, obligations under the Child Support uh, Convention. We heard today about the Aposti Convention and the e-app. So again, um, uh, we see technology being used by um, the Hague Convention to support um, and even alter um, these conventions. One also sees um, the Hague Conference is sensitive to cutting ed edge social issues. Um, the experts group now on surrogacy, um, the one on uh, cross-border recognition of settled or mediated uh, agreements. Um, and I suppose another area of inquiry is the possibility of work dealing with uh, the recognition and enforcement of protection orders in the context of domestic and family violence. Um, I think also about the set of relocation issues. I mean, maybe again, soft instruments are better. So that's my look backward. And now my look forward um, is to try um, to give uh, some areas where the Hague uh, might operate. I have to say, I don't think really quite as large as uh, Professor Pokar. I'm a sort of small, uh, incremental person. Uh, and so um, you'll have to move away from the giant idea to uh, some small ones as I make my final remarks. Um, in many fields, as I've sort of indicated, uh, choice of law conventions may not be the appropriate path. But there still may be discrete areas where a multilateral convention on choice of law, the sort of traditional Hague method, may still be desirable. Um, the Securities Convention is one that sort of came to mind to make me think about this. Um, and in thinking of new areas, um, I have several possibilities in mind. Um, one is suggested by the prior work uh, in the principles uh, on choice of law, which were addressed to both courts and arbitral tribunals in the narrow area of party autonomy. That was an initial step for the Hague Conference in the field of international arbitration. And one that could prove to be a, a good place for further activity. Arbitration has become more and more important and pervasive in cross-border disputes. But interestingly, international conventions in the field of international arbitration are silent as to choice of law. And private international law conventions don't necessarily reach arbitration. Um, neither arbitral statutes nor institutional rules overall provide um, much guidance. Uh, the UNCTRAL rules say in the absence of designation by the parties, the arbitral tribunal shall apply the law which it determines to be appropriate. Uh, and the UNCTRAL model law refers to the law determined by the conflict of laws rules which it considers applicable. And most arbitration statutes don't address the point at all. So. The agreement about choice of law rules relating to the substance of law to be applied in arbitration in the absence of agreement by the parties seems to me to be a space that is open for further development, whether by a convention or by principles or in cooperation with uh, other institutions. Another discrete area that might prove attractive for a choice of law convention is in the area of trade secrets. Um, the choice of law decisions in various countries are all over the map. It's often unclear whether it's contract, tort, or property choice of law rules that should be looked to. And I know that registered rights, such as patents, copyrights, and trademarks, are likely to prove more controversial um, in trying to get final agreement about the applicable law. But trade secrets, again, it's a sort of small and discreet, narrow area, but it might be one um, in which to explore. Um, the work of the Hague um, Conference uh, also points, as I said before, to identifying areas in need of cooperative uh, solutions. On the cutting edge, and this has been mentioned, is the topic of cross-border data, where the need for cooperation is imperative. Um, my own limitations in the understanding of technology prevent me from saying anything more than noting this and saying, um, 
uh, a number of developments call for greater cooperation among countries. In Europe, the general data protection regulation is about to go into effect. And the United States, maybe most of you don't know it, has recently passed the clarifying law overseas use of data act called the Cloud Act. So a possible practice guide on other potential soft law instruments is a potential area uh, for development. And uh, Hague's ability to access information from governments worldwide to bring awareness of the development in this area is, I believe, a place for future work. One other area I think in need of attention, and this was raised by Professor Bazado, is cross-border insolvency. Um, the global principles for cooperation and international insolvency have been set forth in a project by the American Law Institute, but the possibility of further work by the Hague Conference would be desirable. Here, I stress the possibility, and I mentioned this, that the Hague might look for partners with other organizations to develop cross-border instruments. Often, earlier work has been undertaken or completed by other organizations or institutions, but the unique position of the Hague Conference as an intergovernmental organization offers the possibility of more pervasive uh, international acceptance and the development of uh, some kind of cross-border instruments. Um, and I hope um, that that's a small little bit of work uh, for uh, the Hague Conference. Thank you very much. A small little bit of work. <laughs> Thank you, Linda. <laughs> back to work. With pleasure, with pleasure. Uh, flexibility, cooperation, facilitation, processes, soft law, building blocks, post-convention services. All this reminded me of the fact that when I responded to Yuko's uh, presentation, I was actually referring to two issues that came to my mind, but I only mentioned one, and that was the notion of consensus and how to interpret it and how to apply it. Your presentation made me realize that the other point that I had forgotten to mention, of course, is resources. Uh, if we are to embark on all these developments while at the same time trying to continue to make the organization a truly global, universal uh, organization in Africa, in the Middle East, in parts of Central Asia, where still also Southeast Asia, where a lot of work remains uh, to be done. We have another 125 years. OK, OK. <laughs> I think that for me the conclusion for all of that is, and, and you will have understood that that was actually the fundamentally underlying purpose of this whole exercise and the meeting here is that for me the status quo is simply not an option. And we have to collectively engage really on a meaningful discussion with the members at the end of the day of course of this organization as to where to want where do we go in the next 20, 25, you know, taking it step by step, um, years with this uh, organization? I don't want to abuse my role as a, as a moderator, even under non Davos style. Um, I would like to first ask the panelists if you would like to comment on uh, the presentations of your co-panelists, or if you have questions to cross-fertilize this discussion before I ask the the floor, if they have any questions. Please, Fausto. Just to uh, comment on the reference Linda has made to my presentation uh, the, as being too, too large. In fact, it's not that large. Uh, what I had in mind is uh, bearing in mind a, a context, which a phenomenon which is very large to select some concrete points on which one could work. So, uh, for instance, foreign law is one concrete point. Uh, simple. That, I only meant that no, no, I, I, I know. If you were looking for the most controversial area, you might. I know. Find, I know. Would pick yeah. That. <laughs> yeah, I know. And and we had another example of that recently at the council. Uh, there are a few people in the room here who attended council, and we touched on this in, in relation to uh, um, non-accompanied minors, but please, uh, yeah, but, but it's, it's certainly related. 
and it showed how sensible the uh, or sensitive the uh, the issue is. Please, again, could, could I be, uh, could I uh, bold enough to, to say something again? Uh, just now, Professor Linda uh, Sieberman say, said something about uh, they uh, to do something for the choice of law issues in arbitration. Uh, what I would like to, to ask if it's possible to, for the Hague Conference to do something to coordinate the jurisdiction between arbitral tribunal and the court. Because, because at the moment, according to the New York Convention, the, the court can decide its jurisdiction even faced with an arbitral agreement uh, if the court of a member, uh, if the court of, of a country is seized with the merit of the dispute, the court can decide according to its own, its own national rules to, to see if the, 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 it has jurisdiction over the merits. And on the other hand, the arbit arbitral tribunal, according to the doctrine of competence and competence, is, decide, is able to, de to decide according to, to, to the rules by its own decision. Then I'm asking if it's possible for the Hague Conference to do something for coordinate between the jurisdiction of the arbitral tribunal and the national courts. Thank you very much. On. Okay. Um, as I said, I um, I start small, and these are issues I think much more cl closely associated with the New York Convention itself. I realize that the tech, that that issue is not decided under that uh, under the convention, but um, I would I myself would say, why don't we start with the area in which the Hague Conference has had its uh, expertise and specialization. And that was, if you will, the narrower point about um, choice of law uh, in arbitration in the absence of, uh, of uh, agreement. And because most of the rules and so on have dealt with what you do uh, when there is agreement of the parties. It's tied to um, the party autonomy issues of um, of arbitration, and I think um, I would wait uh, to think about whether or not these other uh, issues really um, can be decided um, uh, at the supranational level. They, these may be issues that are decided best um, in the context of the relationship between courts and arbitration and arbitral tribunals in the particular. Um, uh, in the particular jurisdiction. Thank you, Linda. I'm looking at Tom. We have time for one more question, comment, please. Thank you very much. Uh, Wei Xiaogu from University of Hong Kong. So pretty much an echo and then also a question first to my former teacher, um, Professor Linda Suba from, from NYU. Well, you mentioned something about arbitration. This is something I'm looking much forward into that the Hague Convention can play a greater role. This is also to address Dr. Banner's goal. Uh, so say, for example, one thing which I'm very curious about is public policy. So public policy is, um, on the one side, this is a safety valve. On the other hand, this is a barricade that um, the enforcement of the international arbitral awards as well as the in enforcement of the international judgments uh, will be involved. So I'm wondering whether the Hague Conference can do a bit more because, you know, this is a very unique role about the intergovernmental role for the Hague Conference. So uh, whether the Hague Conference can harmonize um, the public policy in terms of both international arbitration as well as um, judgments, recognition, enforcement at the international level. Having said that, I understand from um, Professor Nishka, uh, Nishtani's point, uh, it's better maybe to first start from the regional level. Say, for example, if we can first harmonize like the Asian principles of public policy, or maybe you know, start from the geo-legal or geo-economic perspective. That you know, uh, these this region, due to sort of like cultural similarity or you know, geographical convenience, we can step uh, from from the first beginning and say whether regional public policy can be achieved uh, at the first step. So um, this is something which I'm very looking forward to. So far as as far as I see. And only IBA, International Bar Association, and ILA, they are doing work in the field. 
um, instead of New York Convention or Hague Conference. And, and very few um, legal academics are doing work in the field as well. So far, only Professor George Berman from Columbia University, they are doing work in the field. I'm, I'm very interested, and I look forward to that um, under the leadership of the Banasconi, that Hague Conference can, can play a greater role in the field. The second one, which I'm also quite curious about, is that um, the Hague Project uh, Mediation Settlement Agreement. Um, Asia has a strong cultural root of mediation. Um, from my personal research, actually, mediation is pretty much combi you know, combined with arbitration as well as litigation in Asia. So I think um, that among the various member states of the Hague Conference, perhaps Asia would be more incentivized. Among the member states, I would be more incentivized to push forward for this project to take place in the near future. And then um, Professor Nishitani will have a critical role to play. Thank you very much. Thank you for these comments. And on, on this uh, latter point, we actually have started to engage in, a, in an interesting uh, discussion with, uh, with Yuko and to see in particular if we can use the Malta process and the working party on mediation within the Malta process as a vehicle and a tool to expand it to Asia and use it for promotion purposes of in particular child abduction convention uh, in Asia and facilitating the acceptance, as it were, of the, of the instrument and the operation eventually of the instrument uh, through that uh, angle. Um, we continue this uh, discussion, uh, will uh, you know, involve uh, all the, the, the members of, uh, of the working party and so on and so forth. Uh, but I think it's, uh, it's an interesting uh, thought and, and, and certainly to be continued. On the other topic, um, I think we, we need to discuss <laughs> that separately because obviously that's huge. That's huge. And we'll start with a collection of data, collection of data and collection of data and then see what to do with it. But uh, that's, that's huge. That's huge. I think on that note, and Tom is giving me signals, uh, if we don't want our excursion to turn into a collective swim contest, we better uh, end here, but not without giving a big round of applause uh, to the panelists, please. Thank you.